hand clap of It should not just be an every Sunday experience. It should not be something that we just do. Come on, somebody. When we come into the house of God, we should come expecting something. We should come in expecting an encounter. We should come in expecting for the presence to be here. For me to feel something that maybe I didn't feel all week long. That I come in and, and I may have come in sad. I may have come in hurt. I may have come in even a little broken. But we are here. And we are in His presence. I'm going to push and I'm going to press. Because I want to feel something. Now, I'm not coming in like Thomas. I'm not coming in doubting. But I want to feel something. Hallelujah. I want to feel the change coming over me. I want to feel full. I want my belly to be full on this morning. I need my spirit man to be full on this morning. Hallelujah. Time out for the same old, same old. It's time to begin to expect something. As I'm reading through Matthew, through Mark, through Luke, don't you know the disciples, they were expecting something. Christ was expecting something. He had to prepare them. Because sometimes what we are expecting and what we get aren't quite the same thing. But the word said that it's for our good. The word said that it's for my good. The word said that he is making my crooked way straight. The word said that he has a word for me. Even in my wilderness experience, I don't care what you're dealing with. I don't care what you're going through. Come on, expecting this morning. I'm expecting something great as the word of God comes forward. I'm expecting so when I walked in the door, I expected to fill Christ Jesus. When I walked in the door, I expected for deliverance to be right there. If I didn't get it right there on that first step, maybe it was the second step, or maybe it was the third step, or maybe it was when I got a prayer, or maybe it was when I picked up the thing, or maybe it was when I got the loving grip from the imposter.
around. I got a praise. this morning. And I want you for forgiveness and sanctification of our hearts, Lord. And I thank you for gathering us here on this morning for this service. It was plan Sunday service. And Lord, the Bible says that what you are there with, you are there with them. And I pray, Lord, that you will come down and fellowship with us on this morning. Of abundance of blessings and power for us, Lord, to 
and do great exploits. And Lord, we rebuke all plans of the Lord and the evil that are in this service. And we pray that you may help us to, to listen to you, Father. Fill us with your joy and make your service a success for your glory, Lord. And we say all these things in your son Jesus Christ's name. Let everyone in the house say, Amen, Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord of this morning. Welcome, 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 welcome everyone on this Palm Sunday. Amen. This Palm Sunday commemorates the Christian belief in the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. When he was greeted by cheers and crowds waving palm branches that, that they set, set out on the ground along his path. According to the Bible, this year, Palm Sunday, and it happens to fall on the 24th of March. Yeah. But the most important period of the Christian calendar is today. This is the Holy Week, saints. Yes. It begins with Palm Sunday starting today. Mm -hmm. Also known as Passion Sunday. Yeah. It commemorates when Jesus Christ entered into Jerusalem as a savior and as a king. Yeah. It doesn't fall on the same day every year, being that it's determined by Easter, mm -hmm. amen? Mm -hmm. But this year it falls on the 24th. Yeah. I want to start off our lesson today a little different than normal. I have a poem I want to read to you that I thought was so fitting for today. I was getting myself together all week. It's been a pretty rough week for me. I've been under the weather uh, since probably s late Sunday night, early Monday morning. I woke up Monday knowing that I had a long week ahead, but had no idea that I was going to be feeling the way that I was feeling. And I'm not one to get under the weather. It's been many years. My wife and family can tell you that I've been tremendously blessed, <coughs> amen, in that area because that's just something that doesn't happen to me. But just because I've been out in the public a little more now and around a little bit more people, I think, you know, uh, when you, you know, interacting, those types of things can get on you, you know. You got to make sure you're cleansing your hands and things like that. And I caught something, man, and it, it just messed me up all week. So I, Y'all pray my strength, amen, because I'm still fighting through it, because I know you can hear it, amen, in my voice, amen, but as I was getting my mind straight and preparing myself to enter to the presence of the Lord this week to prepare the message, I actually had spoke to my dad in uh, mid midday of the week, and I didn't want to sell anybody, but I just didn't know if I was going to make it. I just, I didn't even know if I was going to make it to, you know, to work throughout the week. It was rough. And then I just remember, as I was getting myself together one morning, I was just like, you know what? I got to go. And I was like, I was saying it to myself, I got to go. I got to go. And then something came back to me, and I'm going to get to this in a mess in a minute. I've got to go. And that thing just kept resonating in my head all week. I've got to go. I didn't realize what it was until about Thursday. I've got to go. I'm going to get back to that in a second, but y'all hold on to that, that phrase. Y'all got it? What is it? Hold on to it. Listen to this poem. A poem is entitled, The King. You've always done things differently. And they've never failed. Like the time that you turn water into wine. Or like when you rub mud on the blind man's eyes so that he could see. Or when you heal the paralyzed man because his friends truly believed. And like the time that you entered Jerusalem riding on the back of a cult. And they asked, 
who is this? And they, along with the rest of the world, would soon know. They knew. They knew you as one who healed the sick and fed the poor. The one who turned lives inside out and upside down. The one who had, tw uh, had 12 close friends, raised a man named Elijah from the dead and told a couple, a uh, 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 cripple, to get up out of his bed. But soon, they will see you a more than anyone who had come before. Just in time, hope had arrived. Some cheered and some cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. Save us now. Please save us. They waved palm branches and laid them down so that you wouldn't have to touch the ground. Children sat on the shoulders of parents as they pointed to the one that they've been waiting for. Echoes of Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, fill the city as you move towards the beginning of the end. And as we thought that the king was coming to take his crown, but you knew the king was coming to be buried in the ground, to bring us from the lost to found. Good arise, only to die, only to rise, only the world to realize that you are who you say you are. You are the king. Amen. 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 I thought that was so fitting to start off our service for today. Our subject for this morning on this Palm Sunday. Now, you guys know me. I was in the middle of a series, but the Lord allowed me to break off to give you a Palm Sunday message. I had no idea what he wanted me to minister to you until he kept saying something to me all week. I've got to go. I've got to go. My subject today is, I'm on my way home. Say that with me. Say it again. Our scripture reading will be coming from out of the book of Psalms, chapter number 118, 15 through 29, Mark 10, 32 through 34, and then Mark 11, 12 through 19. So we're going to start off in Psalms, the Old Testament, Psalms 118, 15 through 29. And if you can help me with my scripture reading today. And then as soon as the scriptures are finished, we're going to get right into this word for today. All right, honey, read. Psalms 118, 15 through 29. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind and sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Mark 10, 32 through 34.
Now there were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them. And they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. 34. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Mark 11, 12 through 19. For the next day when they had come out of Bethany, he was hungry and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who brought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money charge changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. And he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be, call be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teachings. 19. When evening had come, he went out of the city. I'm on my way. The Lord had a blessing to the reading of his words. I'm on my way home and I've got to go. Years ago, Uncle Reg, you can probably contest to this. Can anybody or everybody, can y'all go back with me and take a parenthetical? Let's go back to 1973. <laughs> now, as we go back now, just I want you to think of some of the things that you were doing in 1973. All right? You with me? 73. Think about it. All right, 73. I don't even know if you was here. You was here? All right. Now, this week, the Lord reminded me of something from 1973. I was five years old. I was in the back of my father's car. And I think during the, did you have the deuce in the quarter? You had all of them? You had the deuce. You had the deuce with the TV thing, all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was in the back, and, and there was something on the radio, and it caught my attention, and God brought that back to me this week. I've got to go. There was a song that came out years ago in 1973. How many of you remember that great theological parable sung by Gladys Knight in the Pips? It is the story of a man who left Georgia to pursue his dream of becoming a movie star in Los Angeles. While there, he falls in love with the singer of the song and she with him as well. Her life was centered in LA, but his roots was in Georgia. He never comes close to his dream, my God. And he finally, he decides to give it all up and return home on the midnight train to Georgia. My God. He sells all that he has in order to pursue a one-way ticket back to Georgia. Gladys knows that he won't return to L.A. And she has to decide to either say goodbye to him and remain with her family and her friends or say goodbye to him uh, uh, to, um, to, 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 to family and friends to go to be with him. She declares several times, I've got to go, I've got to go, I've got to go. Her reason was very simple. She says, 
I rather live in his world than live without him in mine. See, it cost her a lot to follow the one she loved. If you could have seen Jesus and the way that he was moving the weeks before Palm Sunday. My God, can I preach this? You may have asked Jesus, what's the rush? Sit down, Lord. Come on now. Jesus had, 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 had his face turned towards Jerusalem. It seemed as though he was fixated on getting there no matter what the cost. I've got to go. See, on one occasion, the leaders who were very jealous of Jesus' prosperity had decided they were going to kill him if he ever entered into the city of Bethany again. The word was out that Jesus was on uh, somebody's hit list. But then one of Jesus' friends in Bethany became very sick and needed Jesus' attention. So when he told the disciples, I'm going to see about Lazarus back in Bethany, they were shocked. They said, no, nah, Jesus, no, nah, man. It was just a couple of days ago that the people tried to stone you to death there, and now you're going back? What's wrong with you, bro? Jesus basically replied these words. He said, I've got to go. I've got to go. They said, well, let's go. Even if we have to die with you. We ride together. We die together. Bad boys for God. <laughs> a couple of days before Palm Sunday, Pastor. Jesus was leading the way towards Jerusalem. Mm, 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 mm. Look at your neighbor say, I've got to go. Say, I've got to go. Peter, one of the disciples, went so far as to say, never, Lord. This should never happen to you. Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of of men. Peter, I've got to go. Here's the big question. Why did Jesus have to go to Jerusalem? Well, as we go through this message, you're going to see many reasons why. Suppose you had a week left to live, saints. Here's my questions to you. Where is it that you would have to go? What is it that you would have to do? What would you want to make sure was completed before you left this earth? Well, for Jesus, he had to go to Jerusalem because that's where God's will for his life was at. Remember the words, saints. I'd rather live in his world than live without him in mine. Jesus would rather live in the abundance of God's will. Are y'all listening? and be in God's world than to seek to preserve his own life and God be missing from it. Are you following God this morning? See, every day we are faced with a choice. Say, I'm faced with a choice. Some are real hard decisions that we have to make. Some are seem to be very insignificant, but they will change our lives in ways that they will never have, that we would never have imagined. Each choice comes with a price tag, my God. Here's an important fact, William. Jesus could have decided to not go to Jerusalem that week. But Paul, if he had decided that, he knew what price he would have to pay going to Jerusalem. But if he had decided to stay in Galilee, Pastor, there would be no Palm Sunday. There will be no Holy Week. There will be no resurrection. If you just want to get down to it, there will be no Antioch Christian Center. There will be no hope for us when we stand in the presence of God to give an account for the lives that we have lived on this earth. But because of his love for us and his love for God, 
Jesus went into Jerusalem knowing what he was about to face. Y'all stay with me. I got somewhere to take you. When we, are, when we make our choices in this life, how much of a factor does wanting to be in God's world play in our decision? Are you listening? Our decisions are always affecting someone else's life. Jesus' decision to get on that donkey on Palm Sunday is affecting our life even right now. It was a hard choice to make, yes. Others attempted to discourage him from going where he felt he had to go, but to be in the Father's world, oftentimes the easier options between choices is not the one that God will have us to make. So in the beginning, it is often easier to do wrong than it is to do right. Are you listening? It's when payment time comes that we always wish that we had done the right thing the first time around. My God. Whenever Jesus comes into a situation, saints, there's a division among people in the way that they respond to his presence. Are you hearing me? On Palm Sunday now, Jesus rode into the city on a what? On a cult. There were four groups of people. Say four groups. There were four groups of people lining the way for Jesus to come. Number one, there were those who thought so highly of Jesus that they laid down their coats in the streets for the donkey to ride upon. Their worship of Jesus involved a sacrifice of what belonged to him or to them. They did not have to, watch this, they did not have to, to think long about what they would do to honor the Lord. They did not. They were saying, I've got to go. I've got to go. And I've got to go and present my best, my very best. They did not know it had time that uh, uh, at that time, but for many of them, this would be the last chance to see Jesus in public. Wow, that was the first group. The second group, they, the second group, they were those who would not make a sacrifice of their clothes. They never lay no clothes down, but they would cut down a palm and lay it on the roadway, and maybe they were thinking, well, one day I'll do better in the future. They were saying, I've got to go and present something. It was not much, but it was something. Come on, somebody. The third group of people, they were those who would shout, bless be the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. But they would not give anything. Are you listening? My God. Their worship of Jesus was limited to the words coming out of their mouths. They were saying, I've got to go and put in my two cents word. All talk and no action. But they looked like they were doing the same as everybody else from a distance. All three of these groups were shouting the same what? The same thing. But with very different levels of what? Of commitment behind their words. Now this last group, watch this. There were those who were angry at the attention and the adoration given to Jesus. They just got, they just could not stand Jesus. And wanted to him completely out of their lives forever. They were so bold as to tell Jesus, tell those people to be quiet and shut up and quit treating you as though you are God. One thing about this group, though, is that they were honest. They were lost, but they were honest. And they let the world know the place that Jesus had in their hearts. Mm -mm -mm. That was that group said, I'm going to keep it real. Y'all hear people say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it real. Uh-huh. Jesus came riding in the city very late in the afternoon when the sun was probably just about to set on Palm Sunday. 
The trip ended at the temple of God. Even though the people were shouting all kinds of wonderful things about him as he rode down the Mount of Olive and into the city, Luke, in his account, lets us know that Jesus ended that trip, though, in tears. He knew that the majority of the crowd had no room for him in their lives. My God. He knew that many of the people that day were just caught up in the moment. He knew that when he arrived and saw what was taking place at the temple, that the nation had given God a back seat in their lives. What does that remind you of today? It kind of reminds you of the America that we're currently living in, isn't it? This nation has given God a back seat in their lives. When Jesus entered into the temple, watch this now. He did not hear people singing and praising God. He did smell the incense. Instead, he heard the baaing of sheep and the nine of goats, uh, the cooing of pigeons, the noise of people arguing over the prices, the people going through the temple area who obviously would not come to worship God at all because they were loaded down with merchandise. He smelled animals. He looked at this and cried, oh my God, what is going on in the temple? But since it was near dark, he and his disciples went back out of the city of Jerusalem and spent the night in Bethany. Check this out. The temple area now, let me, let me, let me lay some, some grounds. The temple area covered about 30 acres of land. Can you imagine that? 30 acres of land. And it was on top of Mount Zion. It consisted of two parts. There was a temple building itself, and then the temple courtyards. You got it? Can you envision that? 30 acres now. That's pretty big, right? All right. The temple building itself was kind of small, though. Only the high priest could enter it only once a year. Say once a year. First surrounding the temple would be the court of priests. This is where the altar was and other things the priests used. Only priests could enter this area. A wall enclosed this particular area. Second, it was surrounded by the court of Israelites. This is where the Jewish worshipers met for services and where they would hand the priests their sacrifices. Women could only enter into this area in special circumstances. Third, was the court of women, say the court of women. This was as far as women could go, except for worship on the great feast day. Fourth, was the court of Gentiles, say Gentiles. It covered a vast space surrounding all the other courtyards. It was the place of worship for all Gentiles who had chosen to serve the Lord. This was the only part of the temple that Jesus entered into on Palm Sunday. You ask yourself, well, why, Pastor? Why didn't he go further into the temple? Let me explain why. Look at the neighbor and say, I got to go. <laughs> Jewish people came from all over the world to present themselves at the temple in Jerusalem for high holy days. The law required all male Jews, 20 and up, to pay the half-shackled temple tax. There were three. Watch this. There were three kinds of money. Say three kinds of money. There was imperial coins from the Roman Empire. There were pro provincial money, which was from the Greeks. And then there were local Jewish money. People had to pay the temple tax in Jewish money. And the money changers would exchange, say exchange, their Roman and Greek money into Jewish money for a fee, though. Sometimes people would get ripped off in their exchanges. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, don't you get ripped off at your exchange. 
you'll get that one tomorrow. <laughs> the people also had to offer certain animals as sacrifices. Watch this. Now. I'm, I'm going somewhere. Some travel too great a distance to bring their own animals from their homelands to Jerusalem, right? They couldn't bring them. They were traveling too far. So they had to purchase animals once they arrived in Jerusalem. Are y'all getting this picture? Okay, let's go back. Where's all this happening at? On the outer court where the Gentiles were supposed to worship. Y'all remember? The only area in which Jesus entered into on Palm Sunday. Come on now, y'all stay with me, class. If they did bring their own animals, the owners would charge the fee to have the animals inspected to make sure of their purity. They're going to get their money one way or the other. There were a lot of bickering over the prices of animals and whether or not the animals were pure or not. Oh, my God. To make this worse, the priest had decided to allow all the money changers and sellers of animals to set up shop in the area that God had designed for the Gentiles to worship. Now, why would the priest do that to the Gentiles? Come on, y'all stay with me. Look at your neighbor saying, I've got to go. <laughs> so, the worship area, watch this, of the Gentiles looked more like a gigantic smelly flea market than it did a place of worship. So other people used this area as a shortcut to get from one side of town to the other. The place looked like anything but a house of prayer. One of the reasons Jesus had to go to Jerusalem was to do something about his father's house. Come on, somebody. Let's walk through this word. People never saw and thought, what are the other reasons why Jesus had to go to Jerusalem? Why did he have to go in there when he could have went anywhere else? Jesus looked at the disciples and said, I've got to go. I've got to go and take care of my father's business. I bought my father's house. They're making a spectacle of it. And I got to take care of it. Good God Almighty. That's what's happening now, Bishop, in the churches right now. The devil is making a spectacle of our churches. Folks is running around acting crazy. God is coming and saying, I've got to go. I've got to go where? I've got to go into the pit of their heart and find out where are they? I've got to go. I've got to go and seek and search and see, are they really for me or are they against me? Because the house is smelly. A bunch of noise. A bunch of circuses. Stop people running all through the church, in and out of the church, one church to another church, the other church to another church. It's just dirty, smelly, and I'm tired of it. The morning after Palm Sunday, y'all stay with me. Jesus got up. Oh, I feel the spirit of God in this place. God's ready now to come into your heart and to change the way that you're seeing and you're dealing with church. He wants you to begin to respect his house again. He wants order back in his house. Are y'all hearing the Lord this Palm Sunday? Are you listening to God this Palm Sunday? Order has to come back into the house of God. Hallelujah. It's time, saints, that we get this thing right. We've been praying too long. It's been messy too long. The morning after Palm Sunday, let, 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 let me share something with you. When Jesus got up that morning, after seeing that mess in the church, he was ticked off. He was mad. So on the way back to Jerusalem, he saw a tree, 
a fig tree that looked like it should have figs on it. Y'all didn't hear me. And he walked up to it and realized there was no figs. And he said, curse be to you. Nothing that will grow in your tail ever again. See, this is what he's doing in the house. He's going around, he's saying, you know what? What is going on with y'all? Now, you don't want me to do this to you, but if you don't mess around and produce no fruit, I'm going to have to banish you because I'm sick and tired of this smelly, this smelly place. I'm sick and tired of this message and mockery that you're making in my house. I'm sick and tired of it. I'm mad right now. I'm upset right now. Are you hearing God? <sighs> Jesus got up and went back into the city of Jerusalem and went back into the outer court. Say outer court. Jesus became a one army person. Say one army. While people had lined up their money on the tables ready for business, he went in and he turned over the tables of money. Money was flying all over the place. He went from bench to bench, flipping stuff over boxes of doves. Imagine this now. Just understand what's going on. He flipping boxes and turning over tables. Doves flying all over the place. Birds all over the place. He did something to drive those that were buying and selling out of the place. Nobody was allowed to come through that area anymore as a shortcut to another part of town. He said, clean this mess up. He was upset. That's why when he looked at that fig tree, he said, oh, okay, you tripping. I'm on my way to Jerusalem. I'm already mad, and now I'm coming to get something to eat. You ain't got nothing to eat. He was mad. The fig tree was just part of it. He was fed up. Had a long night on his way to Jerusalem to do some work and couldn't eat. Come on now. Don't get in between a man and his food. Once he got everything out, though, that was not supposed to be there. He started teaching in the temple, my God. Jesus was revealing himself as God's son and cleansing the temple area. In cleansing the temple, though, Jesus was demonstrating how we are to treat others and how we are to use the temple of God. This was one of the reasons Jesus said, I've got to go. I've got to go to Jerusalem. This was another reason some of the people wanted to get rid of Jesus. Because he was messing with their money. See, the focus on Palm Sunday, say Palm Sunday. It's not that Jesus rode through the city to a lot of praise and palm waving. The focus on where he was, where he was going, he was going to the temple to do a cleansing. Woo. Say a cleansing. It was not the inner court that Jesus needed to deal with, stay with me. But rather, the outer area of where everyday living was taking place. Oh, you're catching it now, Pastor, aren't you? Yeah, you, you know where I'm about to go. See, there are temples present here this morning. For the Bible says, do you not know that you are temples of the Holy Spirit, which lives within you? This Palm Sunday, say Palm Sunday. Jesus riding on a donkey, and he's stopping at the temple of your hearts. He knows the most of us are okay where the inner temple is located. We, are not, we know the law. We know the word. We believe the right things. We've given our lives to him, but Jesus wants to do an examination of the outer court of our lives. Did he bring this thing together or what? When Jesus cleansed the temple, he was asserting his right to clean up his house in the manner that he wanted it cleansed. Do you recognize Jesus has the same claim over every part of our lives, including our outer area, our, our lying areas? The Bible tells us that every believer has been purchased by Christ, which means that he literally what? He owns us. All of us, not just the religious part. If he marched in with his army of one, would he see a relationship in which we are taking advantage of someone 
be it a friend, a, a customer, a, a family member, is Jesus saying, I've got to go there with you. We've got to make something right in your heart. Would Jesus overturn our tables with money because we have set aside money that should go for his work to steal and claim it for our own? It was he who put us in charge of spending 100% of it as a good steward. Is Jesus saying, I've got to go there with you? You're not spending it correctly. Would he overturn the clutter in our lives from being so committed to this group, that group? this club, that club, so that it could restore the area provided time in our lives for worship again, for prayer again, for learning about him again? Is Jesus saying, I've got to go there with you? We need to establish some more priorities in your life. Are you hearing God this morning? Saints, I didn't come here to be here in front of you all day. I came here to deliver a word of change for you. God said, well, it's Palm Sunday. Are you listening? It's time to examine yourselves now. It's time to say, okay, yeah, I do know the word. I do go to church. But this outer layer is still a little funky. Come on, somebody. I can do some cleansing in this outer area. And what is this outer area tray of our lives? The outer area is what we do outside the church. Come on, somebody. The people we're hanging around with, William. The company that we're keeping. Do they understand and respect us? Or do they just come in our outer court and they pass through and in and out of our lives, coming through in and out, and all kind of traffic in and out of our, court, our outer court. Things are happening, and we don't have it cleaned up. People out in the street don't even know that you're Christians. Because you're looking just like everybody else. You're acting just like everybody else. You're talking just like everybody else. Daddy says, time to clean this mess up. That outer court, oh yeah, you good, William, in the inner court. Trey, you're good in the inner court. You're at church. You're doing it right there. But what are you doing outside? Palm Sunday. Jesus said, I got to go. I got to go to Jerusalem to clean up my father's house. <sighs> Jesus is riding into the temple as a confirmation of his love for the people of Jerusalem. He's riding into our lives is a confirmation of his love for us as well. Some of the things and some of the people had to be sent out of the temple. Watch this. Before Jesus could sit, before Jesus could sit and do the kind of teaching that he wanted to do. Now, 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 now. I know you might not want to hear this. But in order for Jesus to clean some stuff out of your outer layer, <laughs> You're going to have to get some folks up off your boat. You thinking it's all good, but God is saying no. You got too many messy people in your life. And in order for me to do what I need to do in your life, you got to clean some people up out of it. Because I can't preach to you, I can't minister to you until some people that's in your life get out of your life. Can we talk? I preached a message 26, 25 years ago talking about you got to get some people off of your boat. Do you remember that? I took that message all across the United States. I preached it in Miami. I preached it in Vegas. I preached it on Bobby, Bobby Jones' BET special. You got to get some people up off of your boat. God is coming right back 25 years later and saying the same thing. In order for you to get to where I want you to go, come on, somebody. In order for you 
to receive LL, the things that God wants to minister to your heart. You got to get some people up off your boat. Why is that? Because they're trying to keep you discouraged. They're trying to distract you. They're trying to keep you from hearing the voice of God. God is coming just like he did Elijah and said, where are you? I know your inner court is good. I know you're going to church, but you messy on the outside. You're smelly. If we are not open to being cleansed by Christ, then the resurrection, which we will celebrate next week, will offer little hope for a richer life. Jesus loved the temple. Jesus loves you and Jesus loves me. But his mission would not be complete without making a change more suitable to his liking. There were some in the temple, though, who would only, watch this, only allow themselves to be angry and upset with Jesus. They were unwilling to yield their lives to him. To follow Jesus would mean giving up their very way of life. There were others who came running to the temple because they saw Jesus was taking a stand. Ooh, I don't think they caught that one. See, Uncle Red. When we decide, Trey, to take a stand, that's when the people don't come running. <laughs> you can't say Joseph. I think that one went over people's heads. If we, Paul, don't take a stand, ain't nobody coming. They're just going to keep passing through, passing through, smelling all funky, smelling all nasty, bringing all mess to you, bringing all mess to you. Why? Because you look just like they look, and you smell as funky as they are. So ain't no change going to come. So God can't minister to you. God can't bring change into you because you ain't getting those people up out of your life. You're not taking a real stand. You're playing you're playing. Are y'all listening? I got 10 minutes. I got to take my seat. Listen to me. God said it's time to take a stand. On this Palm Sunday, you got to get that outer court cleaned up. And it's time to remove some people that ain't got your back, don't have God's back. up out your life and up off your boat. <sighs> Let me find some way to shut this down. Now on their behalf now, let's go back. Let's go back. There were others who came running to the temple because they saw Jesus was taking a stand on their behalf now so they could be made right with God. See, when people start seeing you take a stand, Susan, then they're going to come to the house of God to make sure that they get right with God. Because they're going to realize time is going short here. And I think I need to come and get myself ready, too. But at first, it's going to start with you. Are y'all listening? Ron, well, it's going to start with you, baby girl. All of us taking a real stand. I noticed something, and I told my wife this other day. I said, I've always been a man of respect, because I don't really play. A lot of people see me and say, you don't appear to be too approachable at times. But I noticed that also grants me a lot of respect, because people don't know how to approach me. They don't know what I'm all about. So when they come, they come tipping carefully, trying to figure, What's up with this dude? The other day I was telling my wife, I said, look. I said, my head gets cold in the winter. So I had to wear something on it. I said, but then the funny thing about it, in the summertime, the sun burns my scalp. Does it burn yours? 
It burns the top of my head. He, he's almost like he don't pay no attention. He pay attention. He's sitting at that pool and that uh, some beat on him. Put a towel. I seen him with a towel over his head. Yeah. You seen it too. That because that sun be burning your head. I said so. Even in the summertime, I have to put something on my, on my head. So I had to decide. Lord, I was wearing baseball caps for years. I said, but that Lord, that made me, made me look like the well. Made me look like any other, like I did when I was young. I said, I'm older now. I need something else. I started doing research on African culture. And I started realizing what the culture was. So then I said, you know what? I'm from African descent. I said, I can use those things. So I started wearing kufis, all different kinds. I got like 50 different colors and 50 different, uh, uh, like four or five different styles. I keep my head covered. I said, but you know what, baby, I found out? She said, what? I said, when people approach me, they say, hello, sir, how are you today? I kept saying, and I realized something. They thought I was a Muslim. And she said, huh? I said, let me tell you something about Muslims. They get respect. I said, I never met a Muslim that was dumb. They were always very intelligent and astute, and they knew their stuff. And people know that too. So when they meet and greet them, they do it with respect. They walk up, they say, assalamu alaikum. <laughs> I look at them and say, hey, but I'm a Christian, bro. How you doing? <laughs> Are you feeling me? But I noticed something. Respect isn't given. It's earned. Bishop said, you got to make sure you dress for success. When you do that, people respect you. Are y'all hearing me? This Palm Sunday... God is telling you it's time to clean up the outer layer. Begin to look like you're a Christian. Not just be one, but look like one. So you can get respect. Not just from young people. From older people. Astute people. How you doing, sir? I'm good, man. How you doing? Come on, somebody. I'm bumping heads. Pastor Jessica and I, who, you just said you bumped heads with somebody just the other day. Who was that? Tim Kane, his assistant. We bumping heads with the mayors on occasions. We bumping heads with people, and guess what they're saying? How you doing, sir? Why? Because the Christian, the Christ that's in us, they can feel it and sense that there's something different about you. It's if we look like any and everybody, they will look at us and think that we're just any and everybody. But when they see us, they see God. Not because that's what he's in us, but because we cleaned up the outer court. Now you're getting it. This is what God said. Jesus rode into Jerusalem, not for why many people think, but he went in there to clean up the temple. Just like he's riding into your hearts today to clean up your temple, your outer court. Are you getting it? Let me go and take my seat. As Jesus entered into our temple, into our lives today, which of the two are we more like? Jesus asking us to come and go with him in a life of obedience to the word of God. Can you say like Gladys Knight? I've got to go. I've got to go. I'd rather live in his world than live without him in mine. Give God a hand clap of praise. 